Hello, hello and welcome to a new episode in my journey to a new CNC router. The last episode gave a teaser onto the new components and since then I've done mostly preparations and planning. Well, it turns out it's a lot of work. I mean, seriously, a lot of work. But anyways, before I can get started with building, I need a place for the new router. So today, on the Ministry of Broken Endmills, it's all about that base. Other than show you endless footage of someone trying to put together what really is just an over-engineered table, I thought I'd give you a rundown of what my considerations during base design were. In essence, good engineering practice always comes down to first identifying main functions, second considering requirements and restrictions, and then going onwards towards the actual design. In this case, it really is just that simple. All the base really has to do is provide a stable platform for the machine. This is especially important for a router style machine, as these are generally not fully rigid on their own in the way a small VMC is. A machine on a flexing base will cause all sorts of trouble. Alignment and drive tuning will be a nightmare, machining results will be subpar, and overall, trust me, you just won't have a good time. Come to think about it, the floor looks great. I guess it will be just fine. Okay, great. Preparations are done. End of video. See you. Oh, well, of course it's not. There are further things to consider. First, the machine needs to be accessible in an ergonomic way, which for me means it has to be off the ground quite a bit. Your personal experience all may differ. Second, I need to be able to level it because my floor is neither level or planar and the machine design doesn't include its own feet. Third, and this is really crucial, I require storage underneath the seat for stuff like a vacuum pump, the spindle chiller, and most importantly, two large cabinets with drawers for tools and toolboxes of all kinds. On the side of further restrictions, I have some limitations in material. I don't want to build something like the base from wood, as regular cabinets, which I know from my previous design are of limited stability, and a timber frame construction is rather bulky. Further, I have no good mean to process steel and I have no access to welding. I can't use a welder in this basement and welding a solid base elsewhere isn't an option as it has to come down a set of stairs and around a few tight bends into this basement workshop and likely will have to leave here in the foreseeable future. This really just means one thing and it's going to be aluminum extrusions. Alright, that ain't too bad. We can now just build a four-leg table, put a cabinet underneath and be done with it, right? Well, as always, it depends. In my case, the router is estimated at around 300 kilos and requires 1,500 by 850 millimeters of surface area. The weight of the moving portal is estimated at around 120 kilos. Withstanding static forces is one thing for the table, but a CNC router will also introduce dynamic forces and vibrations on top, which the base must be able to handle. You see, Newton's axiom really are annoying sometimes and there's just no way to get around them. This is to say that if your machine is accelerating, a force will result. You do remember force equals mass times acceleration, right? And accordingly, a reactive force in the base will follow, which will act mostly in the top XY plane of the base. For small hobby sized routers, the rapid speed is often less interesting than a decent acceleration, although this is of course is substantially lower than 1G. For the time being, let's assume 5 meters per second squared, although it will most likely be much less at the end. This easily results in 500 newtons that we need to contend with. Going back to our spindly four-leg table, we can conclude that while it would be fine for a 3080 China router or your typical 3D printer, it's not adequate for a larger machine. Excluding the risk of buckling for the legs, there is a good chance for it to fail in its joints and simply collapse due to wrecking. And we just don't want that. Bracing, therefore, is the general answer to a problem like this. If we connect the table legs at the bottom of the legs, we gain some stability as the legs are now no more independent from each other, but they still have a good chance of simply folding over, which means this design doesn't do us any good. Better yet, we use diagonal bracing, resulting in triangles to take up forces which resist lateral forces substantially better. Bracing is required in all planes, however, and so the base does become a bit complicated and cumbersome. Remember the cabinet base storage requirement I had? Well, if we add diagonal bracing to all planes of the base, access to the cabinets is going to be highly limited. Also, diagonal braces in a design based on aluminum extrusions are fairly cumbersome to assemble and cut to length. To overcome this, I opted to combine three approaches. One, at corner brackets wherever possible. Two, at cross braces at the back and the side like you know them from typical storage shelving. And three, partially use the cabinets as bracing themselves. The later uses a construction method from furniture making where solid back panels are used to stiffen cabinets and prevent them from wrecking and collapsing. 
For the base, the actual cabinets for the doors will be tightly packed in between the vertical frame members of the table, hence adding stability. What this comes down to, you may ask? Well, that's easy. Add a boatload of angle brackets, cross braces, utilize the cabinets and just hope for the best. All right, enough with the endless considerations. Let's have a look at the resulting design while I make this thing in the background. The table is designed using 90 by 45 aluminum extrusion connected with fasteners that thread into the slots of the profile. Furthermore, as can be seen in the render, lots of angle brackets are used to further stiffen the base. Not shown in the render are the cross braces that will follow later. Total dimensions of the table are roughly a height of 910 mm, a width of 1550 mm and a depth of around 800 mm, without the shelf in the rear for the energy drag chain. Alright, enough with the prologue, enough with the preparation, so so mostly complete. Next episode, we will have a look at the mechanical design and it's finally about the actual machine. Further episodes will affect the electrical installation and cabinet, the spindle, the pneumatics required to operate the spindle and the minimum quantity lubrication. And of course, I will have a look at the Linux CNC setup, which will most likely be a bit more in depth and rather highly technical. As always, if you like what I do here, please consider giving the video a thumbs up and maybe even subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Until then, see you next time on the Ministry of Broken Admirals.